Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started today. So um, I thank you for joining us again um, on our, uh, oops, excuse me, on our second webinar um, for Forming Families of Faith. I hope that you got the uh, handouts that I sent to you, which is just kind of a review of what I'm going to present. Um, throughout the evening, I'm going to have a chat going, which is in your bottom right-hand corner, um, where you can chat questions and um, any uh, thoughts or comments that you have. So feel free to do that throughout the, the event, and we will, um, I'm going to scroll down here um, so that we can see. Um, all right, so here we go. So uh, today, this is the, um, let me move this up. This is the Forming Families of Faith, um, part two, part of the Growing Confident Catholic series. And as I mentioned last time, this is a direct response um, to the Into the Deep Parish visits that Bishop made last year um, because people expressed a desire uh, for help in keeping their families Catholic and how to talk to their children and others about the faith. So uh, as we had last time, our special guests are back, um, Leisha and Pat Harrington and Roxanne and Ma Matthew Chumley. And so I'm going to let them introduce themselves again. And we're parishioners of St. Joseph's. Parishioners. We dated through high school. Um, So would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Pat Harrington. I'm Leisha Harrington. We've been married for 32 years. We have three kids, 30, almost 30, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, 26 and 17. Uh, we have worked together uh, for 32 years. We own our own business and we are members of St. Joseph Parish. And this is your daughter. My daughter, Roxanne. <laughs> I'm Roxanne uh, Chumley, my husband, Matthew. He just informed me we've been married for seven years, not eight. <laughs> um, we have one four-year-old and another one on the way in a couple weeks. And, and we're parishioners of St. Joseph's. Parishioners. We dated through high school. Um, so there are Pat and Leisha Harrington. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start with prayer like we did last year. So uh, we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, in you we contemplate the splendor of true love. To you we turn with trust. Holy family of Nazareth, grant that our families too may be places of communion and prayer, authentic schools of the gospel and small domestic churches. Holy Family of Nazareth, may families never again experience violence, rejection, and division. May all who have been hurt or scandalized find comfort and healing. Holy Family of Nazareth, make us once more mindful of the sacredness and inviolability of the family and its beauty of God's plan. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, graciously hear our prayer. Amen. So I just want to do a little quick review uh, of, um, of what we talked about last time. So it is uh, the, the domestic church. Why do we call it the domestic church? Um, because by its very nature, God um, deigned to become present to us in a family, and all families are holy. Um, Pope Francis has a great love for the family uh, and calling it the domestic church. And in his recent document, Amoris Letizia, the joy of love, he emphasized that the church recognized that families come in all shapes, sizes, and forms, um, and that the incarnation of God was set in the context of a family tale. We have betrothal, suspicious conception, public shame, and courageous love. Um, so all of, this, all of this is why their family and holiness are forever entwined. The other thing we talked about was um, by the... In Genesis, God created us, um, created mankind in our image, in his image and his likeness. And so if we are to um, really begin to recognize um, each other as holy and, and create this family of holiness, we've got to start seeing that God in each other. And, and with that, an atmosphere of respect will begin to grow. 
We also talked about our vocation. Our vocation was given to us at baptism and um, the vocation, the primary vocation, to, which everyone is called is to, is to love, is to love others. And we talked about the vocation of marriage and also the vocation of parents. Um, being a parent is also a vocation. Then we talked about where do we start? And we start small by doing something we all eat, which is chow down. Um, we plan a meal and talk to each other. We make it a no tech zone. We pray together, and sometimes it could just be a Our Father or Hail Mary, and we also attend Mass together. Make a plan and keep it simple and stick to it. So uh, I'm going to open up the chat box here, and if you have any comments or questions from, from, from what we talked about last time, so like were there any questions or what struck you in last week's presentation, if you can type that in, um, or what challenged you or what comforted you. Okay, well, I'm guessing that everybody's doing okay then. Um, maybe we're just not ready to chat online with everyone. So we're going to close that down a little bit. So we're going to go on. So the, the one part of, of creating a holy family is just the art of listening. And um, it, is, it is the power of listening. Um, and so I want to show a video. Uh, this is um, Dr. Tim Hogan, who's doing a presentation, a national presentation. And, and I think that he can probably, he can explain this much better than I can. So let's check out Tim. The first of those three keys uh, begins when we notice each other's faces. And I know this sounds simple, but it is incredible to me that God has put six billion people on this planet and all of us have very unique faces. And the first step, I think, in listening is paying attention to the uniqueness of those faces. Uh, Pope Francis reminds us that reawakening to the uniqueness of each other's faces is actually going to be a link to reawaken to the sacred otherness that each of us ought to have for each other. He puts it like this. He says, the aesthetic experience of love is expressed in that gaze, which contemplates the other persons as ends in themselves, even if they are infirm, elderly, or physically unattractive. So Pope Francis is saying that it all starts with slowing down and paying attention, paying attention to the sacred otherness of one another. I wonder, I was wondering to myself how, what that looks like, and I was reminded of the way people greet one another in South Africa. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in South Africa, they greet one another by saying, Sobona. And Sobona means, I see you. And as I was doing a little research about that, it says that people in South Africa mean by that, I see your humanity, I see your vulnerability, I see who you are as a person. It kind of captures this sense of otherness. I had a great uh, supervisor I used to work with, and she used to say to me when we'd sit down to do our session, she would start our session by saying, it is just so good to look at you. And what she meant by that was we would do a lot of work by phone, but then we'd sit down in her office and do supervision. And it was always such a grounding experience, and I think it prepared her to listen well to me. And, you know, this really noticing each other's faces is something we don't do well in this culture. And the impact is pretty severe, I think, in the way it hits our families and relationships. One of my uh, favorite uh, experiences that I ask couples to have with me is uh, very often when they'll be lost in their heads and with what's wrong and all the rules that have been broken in their marriage, I'll ask them to stop talking and I'll ask them to scooch close to each other and sometimes close their eyes for a moment or two and take a deep breath and remember who they are and remember who their partner is. And then I'll ask them in silence, about 18 inches apart, to just open their eyes and stay with each other's eyes, sometimes for two, three, four minutes. And it starts oftentimes very uncomfortably for people. But the amazing thing happens, uh, that happens over time for partners is as they take in each other's eyes, something triggers in them. And it is not at all unusual for partners to begin to weep and husband and wife to begin to cry, and they don't know why they're crying. They just are beginning to feel again the sacred connection that they once had. 
All that happens not through words, not through ideas, not through theories. It happens because of the mystery of the sacred gaze of finding each other's eyes. And so I think this is really the first step of listening. And this is what Pope Francis is inviting us to do, is get good again at bringing that gaze to one another. I often think of this as part of our incarnational ministry, what we do when we are loving people on behalf of Jesus, which is we are showing up and bringing that gaze of love that first drew us to God in the first place. Only now we're bringing it to, to one another so that when they see us and they see us studying them and wanting to understand them and caring about the expression on their face, uh, they are experiencing really God's love in a way that is quite powerful. I think that's the first step and it's probably sometimes the most difficult, but it's a very powerful step. Uh, when I was a student at Notre Dame, one of my favorite professors was uh, Father John Dunn. Uh, he was a Holy Cross priest who they say has taught more Notre Dame students than any other professor, in part just because he lived so long. And everyone loved him. But one of the keys that um, Father John talked about was how important it was, especially with people from different religious groups or people who have different beliefs, to be able to leave all of our judgments and thoughts behind and really cross over and engage other people so that we can experience them uh, in a real way. And this is a theme we find throughout Pope Francis's writings. If you remember Enjoy the Gospel, Pope Francis reminded us how important it is to take off our shoes when we enter the sacred ground of the other. And this is, I think, what we need to do if we are going to listen really well and really hear what people uh, have to say. I know I learned this uh, when I was a young psychologist at the Children's Hospital, and uh, I used to work with children with diabetes. And one young man, his name was Kendrick, came in, little 12-year-old, great little kid. Uh, he was dying from diabetes, which is unusual, but he was in such poor control because his family was doing so little to help him. Now, this doesn't make sense to people who take care of diabetes for a living. And so the staff had become very angry with the family and about why his diabetes was so bad. And so we would talk with them and they tried figuring out what was wrong, but they could not figure out what was wrong. So he would go in and out of the hospital. One day in my frustration, I had been called to consult on this case and I met him several times. Finally, I, my lunch hour, I just left my office, uh, got in my car, <laughs> drove to his elementary school, which of course broke all HIPAA regulations, but the good news was there weren't HIPAA regulations back when I did this. So um, I went and sat down in the classroom uh, with his teacher and I said, would you help me to understand Kendrick? Because we love this guy, but he's not gonna be alive in high school if we don't do something different. Well, I came to find out that Kendrick's family was in a lot of trauma. The mom did not know how to read or write. Uh, they had all kinds of trauma. The mom had been assaulted recently. Uh, they had had to move several times because they didn't have money. And then the kicker was, I had learned that Kendrick, just a couple months before, had gone up to the local store with his friend on his bike. And as they were about to go in, a car drove by spraying the, sh the store with bullets and hit his friend and killed his friend. And his best friend had died in Kendrick's arms. Now, when they come to the hospital, they didn't tell us any of that. Somehow they didn't know that that was important for his diabetic care. But when I kind of passed over the comfort of our hospital and went into the hood and talked with that teacher, I learned all kinds of things on that ground that then allowed us to give Kendrick the help that he needed. He needed someone in the home. They needed someone to teach them how to do diabetic care without using a lot of words because the family didn't read. So it was one of these great experiences. And, and that one's sort of obvious, but you know, the people in our life, especially people who come from a different background, whether it's a different religion or even from a different like school of thought within the Catholic church, when we start talking about things like divorce and homosexuality, very often, if we're gonna have a meaningful conversation with someone, we need to master this art of kind of leaving our world behind, crossing over this bridge and engaging people in their own unique world. Because here's the reality, you know, everyone has come to their conclusions in life based on a whole series of experiences, of abandonments, of betrayals, of pain, of blessing, of ecstasy. I mean, life is so complicated and we all get to these places where we think things and believe things uh, in different ways. And I often say, I've never met two couples who are divorcing, who are divorcing for the exact same reasons. Every couple is 
unique. Every person who has a, diff a different sexual orientation is unique. Everyone is so unique, it requires this ability to pass over into their world. Um, by the way, as I've made references here to different uh, quotes from Amoris Letizia, as I've quoted Father John Dunn, if you are interested in these resources or a little bit more, you can come to my website, which is drtimhogan.com slash MOOC, M-O-O-C. And there I will have listings of all these references, so you don't need to take super good notes or whatever. So uh, he referred to his web address, and that is on your, um, in, listed in your resources in your handouts. So the interesting thing about what Dr. Tim talked about was that, you know, the power of listening and checking emails, texting, talking on the phone, playing on a tablet with no boundaries just makes sacred family time disappear. Um, being in the same room is just not enough anymore. Being present to one another is the first obligation and privilege of a family. A family is the place where we take our autonomy, take out of our autonomy, kept conscious of personal dignity, enriched in deep humanity. Um, I, I, there's so many times, and I think we've probably all seen this, and maybe we were the ones doing it, that um, uh, I'm at a restaurant and I see a family sitting there and, you know, they're on their phones or the kids are on the phones and the parents are talking around them. Um, that it, I even saw the other day I was at a restaurant and there were two, it, I think it was a date, these two kids, but they were texting on their phones. You know, they weren't even talking to each other. Um, and a personal example is that with my, with my family, um, I have four, three nieces and a nephew. And so, um, and they range anywhere from 16 to 26. And um, what we found like at Christmas and Thanksgiving when we had family dinners was this, as soon as the meal was over, the grandkids go out to the couches and start on their phones. Um, it almost took like an act of God to get them to put the phones down. And so we did kind of set up a no phone zone, at the dinner table. So at least at the dinner table, we could sit together. Um, but as the aunt who lives far away um, and doesn't get to have these meals with them very much, it, it is very frustrating. And sometimes I would take it personally, but then I'd have to realize that they are simply a product of their generation, which depends on technology. Um, the point is that we stop. We make it a no phone zone, which my family did. And when someone is speaking, look into their eyes. Be totally present to that person at that moment. The Year of Mercy, um, Pope, this, the image that Pope Francis chose was this one on the top, which was kind of, um, it, it looks different. I mean, it's not an art that we necessarily are familiar with or would enjoy. Um, but someone explained it to me this way, that the word reconciliation, which is part of what mercy is, is if you break it down, re means once again, con means with, shun is the act of, and celia is eyelash to eyelash or eyelid. So if you're really going to communicate with someone, look into their eyes. Look into their eyes. Be that action with them. Feel that emotion. Pope Francis also has, um, you know, uh, some, some words for families. And he has these three key phrases, um, may I or please. And um, through this, you, we recognize that all is gift, that we just can't assume that what yours should be mine or what mine should be yours. We ask, we ask, and it, it, it provides also respect for parents, and, and it gives us an attitude of humility. And then the word thank you. Um, gratitude has its own rewards. God promises to take care of us when we are dependent on him. Everything that we have is gift, our shoes. The fact that we can watch this webinar and participate together is a gift. The fact that we have computer technology to do this is a gift. Um, the lasagna that I eat for dinner is a gift. And when we start to recognize that everything is gift from God, um, it, 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 it kind of starts cultivating that um, environment of holiness and, and, and respect. Um, scripture tells us in 1 Peter, um, each, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace.
So how do you put this together as a family? Um, how do you cultivate this attitude of gratitude, if you will? It's, it, it's as simple as just starting with thank you notes. You know, Jimmy Fallon has that thing on his, on Friday nights, um, you know, where he's, he's catching up on his thank you notes. And they're kind of goofy and silly, but there's a lesson in there um, where do we think about that person or event that happened in our lives that week and do we thank them? So as a family, sit down with your family at the end of each week and, and ask them all to think of a person who influenced them in a positive way. And then ask, did they thank them for what they have done or what they mean? And then as a family, give each one thank you notes and ask them to just write a thank you note to that person. Um, and then the key thing is, make sure you send them as the parent, make sure you send them. Um, bishop Gerber, uh, Eugene Gerber, who's the bishop from Wichita, says that a grateful heart silences a complaining voice. So when we do begin to see everything as gift and we are grateful for that, um, we, we begin to realize that, you know, our life isn't so bad. Our life isn't so hard that God gives us what we need to survive. And the third phrase is, I am sorry, please forgive me. How often have we told our children to tell someone they're sorry? And when they do, it's a half-hearted sorry. They really didn't mean it. They're just like, okay, I'm sorry. Um, sorry has become a lazy word. It's a word that doesn't accept responsibility for our actions. Uh, it assumes the other person is okay and moving past it which is not what it's about at all. Um, when we switch to saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me, the whole dynamic changes. You humble yourself. You're giving the power, the control to the other person, the person you offended, and you have to wait because they may still be so angry that they cannot forgive you. Um, long time ago, I went on a, an engaged encounter and my sister and her husband were very involved in engaged encounter too. And that was one of the things that just, it jumped at me was, um, you know, to say, please forgive me. Um, you know, we can just say, I'm sorry, and then move on. But to acknowledge that you really have wounded that person and that that giving that person a, a chance to respond, that is the value of reconciliation. Remember, it's that seeing eye to eye. Um, so these are just three key phrases to kind of start working with your family or just with your spouse, you know, um, and if you're a single person with the people around you, asking them, please, may I borrow your music? You know, uh, asking your spouse, please, will you pass the vegetables? I mean, I, I, I laugh when I go home at my parents and, and it's like, you know, can you give me the peas? Will you give me the chicken? And it's like, can you say please and thank you? I mean, I'm sitting there going, can you say please and thank you? <laughs> you know, uh, because they may not do that. So um, uh, I was just looking to see what Kathy said here. There's are things I was taught and expected to do. I feel the younger generations are losing these skills and the respect that they intend, extend. Yes, Kathy, I would agree with you completely. It is a lost art. It is a lost, sorry has become a, a lazy word. And um, it is up to us as the parents, the aunts and uncles, whatever your role is, it is up to us to teach that. We can't expect society to teach that anymore. So I'm going to do a little shift because a lot of this, you know, it's easy to apply to um, children, to young children, but then what about our teenagers? So I'm going to, I'm going to take a little shift here and we're going to talk about, um, uh, about how does this affect children? So um, there was this study, it was from 2002 to 2008, and it was called the National Study on Youth and Religion. Um, and um, it was a cooperative between national Catholic organizations who had been sanctioned um, by the U.S. bishops um, and, and, and the University of Notre Dame. So uh, this is some of the research that follows, um, but I, I want you to see what the research showed was that the single most important influence on the religious and spiritual lives of parents of adolescence is the parents. So one of the questions when I was with them with our couples was I asked Roxanne about what it was like watching her family pray, um, especially her dad. And so let's hear what Roxanne has to say. So would you say that like one of the, how your parents um, lived their faith, like for your dad was through adoration, that that mm -hmm. influenced you greatly? And because it's not a practice that's common, really common yeah. here. Yeah, to, um, 
to see, especially your father pray, mm -hmm. um, is, is something that is a huge influence on their child. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we look at um, the father of the house as the, the rule maker, you know, the, the person that kind of you may be a little more afraid of when the you get enforcer. in trouble, the enforcer, yeah. Um, and so to also see that same person be the leader in the faith, you know, was, was very important um, growing up and um, was, a, was a huge influence on, on my life. And, and both of my parents encouraged um, from a young age, you know, even though we went to Catholic school, we still went to Sunday school. <laughs> I think we were the, you know, all the other kids were in CCD, you know, because they didn't go to Catholic school. No, we had to do both. Um, and, you know, and then they encouraged youth group, you know, um, when I was in high, middle school and high school. And um, I would come home and complain about the youth group or whatnot, and they said it's too bad you're still going. So, um, yeah, prayer and you know, learning your faith was encouraged strongly. You know, and especially um, my dad having an adoration hour. Just it did. It stuck out. Mm -hmm. Stuck out to me. Something um, different. As something, yeah, something different and something unique. And um, so. It You know, as, as um, often it's easier to pray with our little children when they're young children. It's easy to pray with them. It's easy to say, uh, angel of God, my guardian dear. It's easy to do the thank yous and the, um, uh, you know, thank you God and God bless mommy and daddy. And I don't know what, at what point that becomes awkward that that stops happening, but it seems to be kind of a, it seems to be the norm that at some point when they reach teenage years, that those conversations of faith stop. And so, you know, Roxanne and Matthew, um, they, they worked in youth ministry in their parish. And so they saw from the other side of how teenagers and families intersected when they came to their face. So I, I want you to listen to Roxanne, please. So Roxanne, you were in, Matthew, you guys were in a unique position because you were working with youth ministry. Yeah. And so um, tell us what you saw, you know, when the families of the kids that you worked with. Yeah, I mean, working, it's, it's, uh, it was a great opportunity to work, you know, with youth and other families for, um, I don't know, it's six, six years. Um, and seeing those kids, when I first took the job, I said, I want to see the freshmen graduate. And I'm so glad that God kept me, you know, even through that, because I got to see some of them go off to college and, um, but one thing that I noticed as a youth minister is that um, there was a disconnect when it came to um, families talking about their faith at home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, each of the parents, they may have gone to Mass, they may have been great Catholics and, you know, gone to Sunday Mass and the, the kids were great and everything and they, they would uh, pursue their faith. Um, but there was this disconnect about coming together as a family. Um, and when those kids would go off to college, um, sometimes they would, you know, I'd see that they would get involved in, in other things and be pulled away from the church. Um, and, I, and I think that not having that stability at home, that those continued conversations at home about faith, um, you know, would, would kind of, when they were off on their own, it's like they would, they would do whatever, um, they were being pulled to, which who doesn't, you know, who doesn't when you're, um, you know, like we've said over and over, we need that accountability. And so do our kids, our children need that, need that accountability from home. And, um, it's interesting, my, my mom was saying one of our rituals was to, to pray together um, or even just 
have dinner together and discuss, you know, what bothered you today? What do you wish God would have helped you out with today? And, um, and then she went on to say how my brother will pull out this, you know, devotional and read it to them. If, if they wouldn't have had those conversations at home, he wouldn't have felt comfortable to pull out this, you know, devotional and, and read it to his, to, to them. Um, and, and even as my relationship with my siblings is also different because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, talking about faith at home means that my brother, if he's going through something or if I'm going through something, he calls me, you know, and we talk, some of my friends think it's so funny. My brother and I talk almost every day. Um, and we're four years apart and, you know, he has a different life than I do. And, but he'll call me if there's something going on, if there's something that's really bothering him, he'll, you know, he'll call me to talk about it. You know, even if it's just to, I need to vent, I need to breathe. Um, and he does that with my parents too. Just, we were allowed almost to be vocal. We were allowed to share our faith. We were, we were given that opportunity um, to be comfortable with our faith. Mm -hmm. And, and comfortable vocally. Yeah, comfortable vocally. Yeah, comfortable to, to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, even when we didn't like it. You know, I remember there was a time where I was like, I don't want to go to Catholic church anymore. <laughs> it's boring, yeah. you know. And we were allowed to say those things. We were allowed to say how we... I felt so we still were going to mass on Sunday, but those those um, opportunities that, that that conversation could happen, mm -hmm. and um, watching some of our youth and youth group, uh, it's like they would open up for the hour that we were. Okay, so um, what she went on to say, they'd open up with the hour that they were with them, but she would watch them walk out the door and it would just shut off. They left it at the door. So um, I, I, I don't know if you caught, but some of the language that I hear these two couples using is like in this clip, Roxanne said, God allowed me to stay in the youth ministry for six years. That kind of language is the kind of language that I was talking about before about recognizing that everything is gift, um, recognizing that the ability for her to stay in that ministry was gift from God. Um, you know, the ability that the parish was able to pay for her ministry was a gift from God. And so that's kind of the language. Um, so I, I, as I continue talking, um, or if you want to go back and listen to them later, you can catch some of that language. And it, it is very, very telling because it's not language that uh, generally we're, we're comfortable using. Um, we don't talk, a lot, sometimes we don't talk about God publicly. Um, so, you know, just to kind of keep that in mind. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to go to um, back to you, see if there's any comments, questions, or concerns. And so you can type them in. Um, I saw that Kathy said that many parents don't realize or expect, accept their commission responsibility to be the primary teachers of the Catholic faith to their children. And they leave that for church um, or youth group or other church sponsored events. And, and, and that is true. And uh, sadly, we as a church, um, that is something that we need to pick up. We've got to start helping our parents have those, those conversations. Because the reality is, is that, you know, prior to Vatican II, and even just shortly after that, the kids went to Catholic schools. Almost all kids went to Catholic schools. If they were Catholic, they went to a Catholic school. And that is where the faith was taught in that Catholic school. It wasn't necessarily conversation they had at home. Um, but it was taught in the Catholic schools. Well, as we have fewer and fewer sisters, then we have fewer and fewer Catholic schools. And we are a larger society and a more mobile society. So we, um, we're still depending on our church to have those conversations. But the flip side of it is the church hasn't necessarily done a good job of about teaching us how to have those conversations. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a give there. It's something that both sides need to work on. Um, and and how, do we, how do we have those opportunities? You know, think about when you have um, 
when your child makes first communion, um, you know, if you are a catechist, use that as an opportunity to gather the parents with their children and talk to them about praying together. Um, if you have, you know, you're having a big birthday celebration with your family, um, make sure like when you're singing the birthday song that you also, you know, thank God for giving you life and giving you the opportunity to gather. It doesn't have to be a big, huge production. Just kind of slip it in and just keep slipping it in and it'll become habit and, and the people around you will get comfortable with it and may even kind of start using some of that language themselves. So if you have any questions or comments um, or concerns that you'd like to type in now, please feel free to do that. Okay, so if you're still typing, we'll come back. Yeah, I'll come back and catch those questions. Um, so one of the things, uh, oh, let's see, uh, Kathy added some more. I think parents feel they don't have the knowledge of the faith, but don't always take the time to learn what they need to be more comfortable to talk with their children. And it, it's kind of that cycle that, you know, their parents may not have talked to them, so they don't know how to talk to them. And and, and that's part of what this series is about, is to how, how we help our families have these conversations. It's not easy. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it just has to be a learned behavior, as I think Roxanne said before. It's something that, that you learn, and you start small. Um, so if you have paid attention through some of the videos with our couples, they've talked about um, their support groups. Um, uh, Pat and Leisha talked about their married couples group, and Roxanne and Matthew talked about their domestic church group circle. So think of these kind of like positive peer pressure. Um, just as you want your kids to surround themselves with people who have the same values, it is wise for families to surround themselves with the same thing. And that also holds them accountable. There's an accountability with that. So um, I'm going to let Roxanne tell another story uh, about her experience with accountability. You know, how as the church you know, how have we taught married couples to do that? Right. Um, and I can say that without another couple inviting us to that informational meeting, um, I don't know if, if we would have made steps to really grow our marriage in holiness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, it, it took that... Um, it took that meeting to educate me mm -hmm. um, that that your marriage is, you know, so important to the growth of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Your family is so important to the growth of the Catholic Church. And I remember they they asked, "What if every family did these things?" You know, um, and I you know, remember leaving and be like, we don't do any of those things. <laughs> like, we have a lot of work to do. But, um, yes, definitely a, the accountability. Um, so tell your story. Okay, so tell my story. Sorry. <laughs> Get to the story. Oh, I thought I got out of this. Yeah. <laughs> Ew. Go on, man. So, so, our, um, <laughs> so we have, like, a circle of, of other couples that are also <laughs> in this movement with us. Um, and we meet monthly. And um, one of the promises, because we have, you know, different promises, one of them is to, to pray as a couple and to pray as a family. And, okay. Um, so just about a month ago, um, and mind you, I, I have to give this disclosure, I'm pregnant and have hormones and emotions, you know, that cannot be controlled. But um, so uh, I don't even recall why I was angry, what, what he could have done possibly to uh, upset me, but um, I didn't speak for him, to him for about, I don't know, three days, or maybe it was just short, you know, being short, saying snippy comments, things like that. Um, I even uninvited him to the birth of our child. Um, so <laughs> cut out. <laughs> cut out. Um, and, oh, gosh. Um, and that week, we were going to have our um, domestic church group meet. And so there's, you know, a few other couples in the circle, and I knew that we would be 
sharing about our marriage and you know how we were doing uh, spiritually and how if we were praying together regularly and how our family prayer was going all these things that I knew uh, would eventually have to share you know so there was already that the accountability factor that um, that I would have to tell someone tell someone <laughs> hey I'm just angry at my husband um, but then also one of one of the blessings of praying with your children at a young age is that they're curious and they, they enjoy praying. And, um, sometimes, sometimes. And, uh, Mary Ava, our four year old brought me a book of the divine mercy and in it was a litany. I think it, I think it was a, a litany of sorts and, uh, about the divine mercy. And we were praying that together and I would say one part and she would say, I trust in you. So I would say the next part, and she would say, I trust in you. And she was just so adamant. You know, I trust in you. I trust in you. You know, my four-year-old, just, I trust in you. And as we're praying, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, Matthew sitting there in the living room. I'm thinking, I am not trusting in you. <laughs> I am not trusting in you. And, and um, you know, here my four-year-old that I am trying to teach how to pray and, and, and teach the faith to, in turn is teaching me mm -hmm. and um, it's really hard to pray and be angry at your spouse it's really hard to look Jesus in the face and say I trust in you and you know not speak to the person that you, <laughs> you know, are married to and and have these petty petty things like I said I can't remember what the argument was about um, but that was just another thing that showed me how important it has been to have prayer in our family. Um, you know, before I could hold a grudge longer, you know, <laughs> if I didn't have to look Jesus in the face, if I didn't have to sit down and pray, if I didn't have that accountability. And I, like I said, I need that in my life. Um, because I am, I am weak. I am, I fail and still do even with the accountability, but, um, you know, to, to have prayer, um, to have Jesus to go to, um, and for him to kind of squash all the ridiculousness in my, in my life, um, you know, it has been. Um, I just want to, uh, sister made a comment about prayer in the home is essential and also structure. And, and that is part of the importance of having couples support each other and encourage each other because having structure in, in a family today is countercultural. It is not the norm. It is the exception. And so if someone is going to, to stick with that, they need that help of other people that other couples that they can be accountable to who can help them grow. Um, just kind of like if, you know, when we're diet, when we start a diet or we're going to exercise or, you know, if you have an addiction, there's someone that you're accountable to, you know, when you're dieting, you know, you write down what you eat and you have to show it to someone that's accountability. So that person's going to quiz you on this and ask you and encourage you and maybe challenge you. The same with exercising. If you start a, an exercise regimen and you're with a trainer or you're in a class, you know, the class also holds you accountable because they may call and say, hey, where were you? We've missed you the last two times. Um, or your trainer's gonna say, what's up? They're gonna hold your feet to the fire to continue that good fight. Um, same thing with an addiction. That's why they have sponsors, someone to help them when the going gets tough. So, but we, ha we, have, we have to be careful about who, who we trust to give us advice. Um, wisdom enables us to see the world from God's viewpoint, which can help us come to grasp um, with the purpose and plan of God. It grants us a long range view of the history, examining the present in the light of the past and the mystery of the future and the lived experience of those we trust. So, having other couples that you can talk about you know if you have experienced couples you're going to learn from their experiences if you say you know uh, Lux, like roxanne i've uninvited my husband from from the birth of my child and mean it well a couple who has had several children may say you're just, you know right now it's because of the baby you're having crazy hormones and just take a deep breath and and put a little stop on that and let's think about it again so it's that importance of sharing 
Um, also, when we have other couples, it saves us from the illusion that the spirit of the times is our only guide. Uh, much of what our couples here are talking about, it's not, it's, it's not the spirit of the times. It's not um, what is happening in our culture. It's not what we're seeing on TV, certainly not what we're seeing on TV or in the media. And so if you have people around you, um, they can help, help you remain strong in those points. So um, I'm going to show another video. And, and this is where the couples talk about um, how they got comfortable with praying with each other. Talking eye to eye with, with your with your kids. And and I would like to think that certainly going to church that was a, a given. Uh, we thought that it was important uh, as Catholics you learn you can't miss mass. And so with that, I I do believe that helped develop those times as I mentioned before when you're fussing with each other or things aren't going just right. You do say, Well, okay, with the if, Eating together has worked, and we've enjoyed it. Maybe, maybe I will say a prayer this time because I'm really feeling bad. I talked ugly to my spouse, or maybe I treated my kids wrong, or or so forth. I'm going to ask for forgiveness because that's what that's what it's asked of us, you know. Come so, to God. So, did you guys? Was it every night that you ate together, or how did you how did you deal with that when your kids were in it, high school and they had all those? Extra well, and sometimes you just can't. But even it's then, we might right? before bed or when everybody finished homework, just gather in the living room and say a prayer together. It didn't have to be a long, drawn out thing, but just, I think, just wanted our kids to see us pray out loud, mm -hmm. to see us as a couple pray, and then try to work where they would pray with us, you know. I think that was important. And also, um, he mentioned married couples group. We um, were very involved all growing up, which is why they went to Sunday school a lot. While they would go to Sunday school, we camp had our church. married couples group that we did. We went camping as couples and families, and we had outdoor masses as we camped, mm -hmm. and just tried to keep Christ very visual in our family. Um, I would say. So, Roxanne, you grew up seeing your fam your parents pray and mm -hmm. praying out loud, right? Yep. So you became you're comfortable with that. Matthew, is that something that you were comfortable with right off the start? Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> so how did that is it, you know, there are people that are comfortable saying their prayers out loud, you know, so how kind of talk me through that? Um I think I mean growing up in the Catholic Church you're really comfortable with you know, form prayers. You yes. get say Hail Mary and Our Father, and that's mm -hmm. that's great. Um, but praying where other people could hear you, um, I think maybe I was kind of really introduced to it in, in youth group, where we'd start the night and they'd ask somebody to pray, and they'd be like, "Well, I'll do it." Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's where it started. Um, in, in our marriage. Because there's a vulnerability. Like, oh, yeah. With, with praying, saying your prayers together, facing each other, there's a vulnerability there. Absolutely. I think that, and this is kind of backtracking, um, but praying out loud for us, we, when we first got married, we kind of um, were very fortunate in the sense that we both did something in the church that was very involved, and Roxanne was the youth minister, and I was doing music, and she was also doing music, and so we were very involved. Um, in that sense that we were having to be, we were accountable to the, to the youth. Mm -hmm. And so that drove um, prayer in that setting, um, in, a, in kind of a, a larger setting, uh, me into that area where I started to get comfortable with it. But it wasn't something that we did together as a couple. Um, I, could pr I could pray over a, um, a high school kid but I never, I never prayed over my spouse, and 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 honestly, would not have been as comfortable praying over my spouse, which is which is weird because that is my spouse. Um, and so I think that the um, ritual for I mean for us how we kind of got to it. I mean I think that um, I talked a little bit about we talked about the other day. Um, I spoke with one of our priests, and he was telling us that his um, family met every day for an hour and they prayed as a family. And I was like, that is a ritual. I <laughs> love that. Like, and he said that they basically had Babies to, yeah, I mean, it didn't matter how old you were. 
And I said that I, you know, that's something I wanted, and I planted a seed. And so as we, we kind of started to phase out, and we weren't um, phasing, out of, phasing out of doing um, youth group, mm-hmm. we started this, you know, uh, participating in domestic church, this movement with the circle and these other couples. And that became um, our ritual. And, I mean, in short, basic, basically the things that this, you know, uh, focuses on are you – pray personally, uh, personal prayer every day. You pray with your spouse every day. You, you pray um, with your family every day. You read scripture every day, um, which all seem very daunting, <laughs> uh, but it's what you should be doing. And so, and especially as people who were so involved in the church, it was like, that's stuff that we should be doing anyway. And so that became, and it was almost a formula, that became our um, our ritual. And we're not perfect on those rituals by any means. Right. Oh, yeah, it's a focus. It's not like a yeah. task that we do every day, but that's the So, Matthew, that's the would goal. you have grown comfortable? Pr- I mean, do you think if it weren't for this domestic group that you would have become comfortable praying? I don't think that we would have started praying together. Mm-hmm. And, and that's wild to think about being that we were so involved and in, uh, you know, everybody knew our face, but um, within our marriage, it, it really was the time to relax because we did so much at the church. And then when we got home, that was the place to relax and not – um, not even bring really Christ in. We had Bibles, we, we, we would pray, but it wasn't somewhere where we um, cultivated our marriage. Um, we felt like we were kind of done by serving the church, and that's where the most church showed us that there was a hole. And so now, I mean, that's that's our that's our growing uh, place right now is to is to grow praying with each other. And I'm still not fully comfortable um, yeah. praying um, out loud. Um, just with her. Um, I mean, it just, there's still um, reservations, um, but it's not, it's not what it used to be. And the fact that it, you know, is something now, and it certainly would never have been something that I strove for daily. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. And it's funny going back, talking about this praying of praying for one another as a couple. Um, it made me think of this time of, six or seven months ago, I was really sick at the beginning of this pregnancy. Um, Very, 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 very ill. I mean, Matthew pretty much took over my job. I couldn't really get up out of the bed. Um, Very ill. He was a single father. I mean, he would go pick up Mary Ava, get her ready for bed, you know, get up with her in the morning, all of it. But um, one night he did, he came in the room and, and put his hands on me and prayed over me. And, um, you know, there's something about your spouse praying over you that you just feel the presence of Christ. I mean, he was being Christ for me in that moment. And, um, yeah, without – that's a learned thing. Mm -hmm. That's not something that – we would just know to do for one another. Mm-hmm. You know, that was something that it took being involved in, um, you know, in, in the accountability and the, the, the challenge that this domestic church offers us, mm-hmm. um, you know, that, that I benefit from. Mm-hmm. Um, because was I healed? No. I wasn't healed, unfortunately. I'm sorry. You don't have, <laughs> I wasn't healed automatically, but I was – I was given hope. I was given, you know, that that it lifted your spirit. Yeah, it lifted my spirit. It, it, you know, it showed me first of all how much my husband cares to come in the room and pray over me, um, and how much God loved me through that suffering. Um, but uh, yeah, just him talking about that kind of made me made me remember that. I mean, that makes it easier. That's the that's the fruit. When you get to see the fruits of what you're striving for, mm-hmm. whether it's praying with their couple. And, I mean, it's definitely, we do not do those things every day. We strive to, and that's part of the meeting is to talk about, you know, what held you back from doing this every day. Um, but one of the big things about it is to see the fruit. I think that's what strengthens you um, to do it again and to get better at it is to continue to communicate with your spouse. And you're supposed to tell you that meant a lot to me. You're supposed to tell you, um, you said something tonight in your prayer that I hadn't thought about or that I can pray for you about. Um, I think it's about the fruit. I think that's something that we didn't really mm-hmm. um, ever get to really see in each other um, before we started really trying to do these things every day. And it is nice when you start to see the fruits. I mean, we're in a different place now, especially getting ready to our last one to go off to college. And one 
place that I've seen the fruits is actually in my son uh, who is working for us. And he will pull out a daily devotional and read it to us in the mornings. And, and that is so special to see that he reaches for that. Mm -hmm. um, that's fruit of your prayers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, God didn't answer everything overnight, but it's so great when you can look back and start to see, gosh, I, I thought we were failing the whole time. Right. <laughs> and, you know, that trying and trying and starting over and starting over, and you do see those fruits slowly coming to, and, and at the age we're at now, we still search. I mean, we have Bible study. We have a Bible study in our home. We don't teach it. We look for someone better than us. <laughs> and he comes in our home and teaches it. And, you know, we're just, you just, because we're, we're not capable. Only God's capable, but he'll put the people in our life if we start, like she said, he'll drop things in your lap. You just got to kind of look for them. That's the key is looking for them. You don't have to be expected that you will do everything, that you'll start it, or you'll, you know, if, if doesn't mean you can't, mm -hmm. but he will put things in your life, just in your church bulletin, if you just look, oh, there is something I could go to. Sometimes you just have to step out and be the one that goes to hear that speaker. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... And then once again, I think there are different personalities in, in the marriages and different marriages and so on. I think there are some married couples who might go to a Bible study or go to domestic church or, or go to a, uh, uh, a retreat and come back. And from that day on, every day they pray over each other. They pray to get, they really get it. And they Ooh. jump for it. They jump it. And, and there, might be, <laughs> there might be couples who do that. Um, I haven't prayed. I, I'll do that tonight. I'll pray over tonight since we talked about it. But and you do always seem when you come back from a married couples group or um, or uh, maybe even domestic church once you have the meeting that night, so forth. Uh, you do get energized, mm -hmm. and um, it's almost like if anyone's been in a, a business where you go. Uh, uh, a to a conference. What is the first thing when you come back? Oh, we're going to... And you have 50 things, but you write down a few, and you do two of them. Uh, and that's great. And it's the same thing when we go to a married couple's group, because even the one we went to, there was a, a workbook. Remember the yeah. workbook? <laughs> <laughs> they go on and talk about the workbook and how uh, they never finished the workbook. So, um, again, it's listening to some of the words that they're saying, and they said, you know, surround yourselves with people who were challenging, will challenge you. Surround yourself with people that you admire. Um, it, is, it is that process. It is, it, you know, as, as Roxanne said, you know, having those devotionals, being able to pray for each other, it's a learned thing. And, and how do you learn that? You learn it from, and, and sharing the faith, sharing those life experiences, those faith experiences with other couples. That's how you start to learn it. It is a process. And that's the most important thing to think about is that it is a process. Um, so one step um, that is like, how do you, where is a place for Jesus in your house? Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, the person of Jesus, but where is there a place for the presence of, that reminds you of the presence of Jesus in your house? Um, so I'm going to, again, we're going to listen to Roxanne and Matthew. And I just want to uh, do a little prelude to this. That there's giggling at the begin, beginning of this clip because Roxanne um, was experiencing baby brain and couldn't recall what we had talked about and what I had asked her to reference. So just, just bear with it. And remember, it's just baby brain. Group one uh -huh. time was, um, where's the space for Jesus in our home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of that. <laughs> well, you mentioned before about when you went on mission trips and some of the things that you had seen. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, one of the, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> one of the questions then they said at Esther's, you know, where where is Jesus in your home? Where where is the space? And um, Matthew was better than than I was. He, you know, really wanted when that question was asked. He's like, we have to find a space, you know, that Jesus is present in our home. And 
um, just to be a reminder, right? We need these reminders. We need these things that we look at and go, oh, okay, yes, Jesus, come back into my life. But um, he put the kneeler at the end of our bed, and he actually put his shoes inside the kneeler so that every morning, <laughs> you know, in order to, Guilt. to put his shoes on to go to work, he would have to step over that kneeler, you know, you know, to make it, to make it so that he would kneel down and, and say a prayer. But um, and we, I remember discussing, like, where, well, our office is here. We can't touch that room, <laughs> our living room. You know, where are we going to put There's Jesus? There's just no place. <laughs> where are we going to put Jesus in our home? And um, we happened to go on a mission trip that summer um, with the youth group. And um, we were in Belize. And I was taking some of the youth who were going house to house. And we were asking people if they needed prayer. And you know, these little little homes, one, one room homes, dirt floor, you know, tin roof. Um, and you have three generations living in there, kids sleeping on the floor or on the couch or just wherever. Uh, I walked into this home and there was a huge altar with candles and flowers that were probably, you know, picked that day outside. And, um, curled torn pictures of Jesus and Mary and um, I was talking with the grandmother because there was three generations that lived there the, the grandparents the parents and I think they had about four four children um, and she said every night we gather around this altar now mind you it's a one one or two room home not bedroom home one or two room home and uh, I remember taking a picture of this altar and thought you know what I, I, they made a, a space for Jesus, um, you know, and it was, it was, showed me, it was so important that Jesus had a place in their home, um, you know, and we, we, hmm. priorities, yeah, priorities, I mean, the, the most beautiful thing in their home was not the kitchen, it was, it was an altar, it was a place for Jesus, a place for them to encounter God in their house, and it's like, Oh gosh! Yeah, and and just what that taught the the children. Yeah, you know. So how do you create this space? Um, <clears throat> Here's some pictures of of different spaces to give you some ideas. Uh, so this first one, it's it's what are those those um, items that are important to you and each of your family members. You know, are there Bibles or statues, a prayer book? Um, gather them kind of together gather them together um, and create a table with these items on it. <clears throat> Another thing is a blessing wall. I have one of these in my house in my entryway. I, I am given many crucifixes and crosses um, in my ministry. And so I have a blessing wall where I have all of these uh, secret images so that whoever walks to my front door, because there's prayer and God attached to each one of these symbols. They are blessed by that. So create a blessing wall. Gather crosses and sacred images and place them on a wall that everyone walks by every day or in the entryway. Um, each cross has a special religious meaning. And so when someone walks by it, they will be blessed. Create a family altar. Um, with all souls and all saints coming up, um, this is a perfect opportunity to kind of start this process of gathering pictures of your loved ones who have died. Um, also pictures of saints who are role models for you and for your family. And create a little altar with the pictures, um, with some fresh flowers and a candle. And every night, you know, as a family, uh, go before it and light the candle and, and pray in Thanksgiving for each of these people and pray for, pray for the ones um, you know, ask them to pray for us as well. So it's a perfect opportunity and a beautiful way to kind of get us into this concept of the communion of the saints. This picture just had, it has a diagram. I actually found it on Pinterest <laughs> of, of ways to do. So you, like they have a sacred heart image, um, crucifix with candles, flowers, a, a St. Gerard statue. I'm assuming that person uh, has a great devotion to St. Gerard. They have a little box of rosaries, which I thought was a beautiful thought because um, all the rosaries are there. And so when you sit with your family, you know, everybody pulls out their rosaries. They're just right there and you pray with them. And this particular family also has a little holy water font um, beside it. 
So, and they just, their cloth was just a piece of cloth that they got from the thrift store or the fabric store. It can be very, it's a very simple process, but it's a very sacred process as well. And the most important part is that they're not just decorations. You gather the, your family together around them. You pray together. Um, you know, this is, this is the key. There, it's not just decoration. It's important to use this for prayer. And, and perhaps, you know, in your churches, you can have a little workshop or something on how to create these prayer spaces. It could be even like a 15 minute thing with your parents. Um, while the kids are in PSR um, or after mass. It, it'd be very simple, but it can be very powerful as well. Um, uh, you know, talking about the crucifix, you know, that's an important image in my life. And um, I'm very particular about what my crucifixes look like too. So I, I have a little, a little picky about that. But um, recently I had to go to the emergency room and um, I was there by myself. My family doesn't live, live here. And I was waiting for a friend was going to meet me, but she was in Benton. And so it was going to be 30 minutes before she could get there. And so I'm sitting there. I have a blistering migraine headache. And I just happened to look up a wall and there was a crucifix on the wall. And the peace that I got from that and then the sense of healing and prayer just by seeing that on the wall um, was more comfort to me than the drugs they gave me. Um, so, you know, if we start placing these images before our kids and start talking about them, don't just hang them on the wall and wait for them, you know, to say something, you know, we as the parents or the adults, it's our job to help draw their attention to it and talk about it. So that, that's just a personal story of how images, sacred images really speak in my life. So, okay, so this is a whole lot, and, um, you know, that all of this um, will only transform your family if you practice it. Um, you try and you try again. You model it for your children. You just don't stop. You keep modeling it. Um, to, and, and this quote, to be holy doesn't necessarily mean lofty, mysterious, transcendent life or angelic activity. Perhaps the most sacred thing families can do is simply be the best family they can. Pope Francis has this philosophy. It's called the principle of graduality. And the principle is, is that you, you, you meet someone where they're at and you just walk with them in their faith. You just walk with them. And as you come to know each other um, and, and trust each other, you gradually um, move them forward and move them closer to Christ in the church. And, and think about that with your families. It's, it's not just, okay, we're going to start. It's, we're going to start right now and it's all good. That's not what it's about. It's, okay, where are we at in our family now? And what is one thing? What is one thing that I want for my family to do to be holy and make a plan? and work on it. So I want to listen to our couples to talk about, you know, the importance of trying again. Pat and Leisha did a really good job of this. A workbook, remember the yeah. workbook? <laughs> we did half of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's a story yeah, of our lives. Yeah, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, and I, I even um, waved it at her one when I didn't want to do the workbook. No, no. So, <laughs> Not to but, 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 um, but that's the great thing about faith. Is you can say, oh, I didn't last night, but I can tonight. Right. And you just start over every time. And, and that's so refreshing to me that I can start over with Christ every single morning when my feet hit the ground. I can say, God, it's a new day, and I need you. I need you desperately. And, and he listens to you. <laughs> I, you it's it's um, not that you, we, we think that, um, oh, if we keep, you know, um, prayerful and this and that, God will listen to us. No, the times when we, when we don't do what we should do and we ask for God, he, I think he still comes. I do. I think that uh, um, I, 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 I've heard it said before, you know, does God listen to me? Because maybe I don't pray as much as I, as, as I should. Does, does he listen to me? You know, or is he only listening to the couple who is doing it all right? Doing it all right. right. And I think he listens to me. <laughs> I know he does. He does. He does. He does. Um, so when you think about your family and what is your desire for your family, when you think about your children, you know, as, as parents, we dream, we want our children to be healthy. 
We want them to be happy. We want them to be sex successful. Um, we may want them to go to college. Um, so when you're thinking about all these hopes and dreams for your children, do you also hope and dream for their salvation? Because that is the bottom line. That is the role of parents is to guide our children to holiness. So to consider that when you're thinking about the future of your kids, included in that, if they want to excel in sports or excel in music, included in that is excelling in their spiritual life and um, growing a deeper relationship with Jesus. And I think that a lot of what we talked about um, through these two webinars will show you that. So I just don't want to do a little recap of what the domestic church is. This is a wonderful little video um, from Strong Catholic Families. This is the Universal Church. This is the Domestic Church. What makes the home what John Paul II defined as the church in miniature? Four truths or cornerstones. Family life is sacred. Family activity is holy. Families have a unique ministry. Families are an evangelizing community. Imagine that when you stepped into your home each day, it was as if you were stepping into church. How might you speak to each other? Excuse me, Mom. Sure. Hey, Mom, can you pick me up at nine? Sure. Thanks. How might you spend time together? Share a meal, share stories. So for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be dissecting a rat. It's disgusting. Yeah, but it, it's kinda cool though. Game time, screens off. Who thinks they could beat me tonight? I wanna play Monopoly. I'm taking Mom down. How might you settle differences? Seek and offer forgiveness. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Hey, Mom and Dad, can I talk to you about something? Yes, Mom, Family activity is holy. Just as your family life is sacred, the activities you do inside and outside of the home are holy ones. How does this transform what you do, how you act, what you say? Jesus bless you, Elijah. Have a great time. Be safe. All right. Families have a unique ministry. Consider the gifts each member of your family bring to the world. Put together, these gifts can serve God and others in a way unique to your family. What are your gifts and how can you use them to be church in the world? Families are an evangelizing community. We are all called by our baptism to nurture faith at home so that we can share it with the world outside the home. How are you modeling the sharing of your faith to your children? So the question is, how can your family fulfill its calling? Be the church in the world. Stay in la iglesia en el mundo. Be the church in the world. I want my family to be the church in the world. We are the domestic church. This reflection is brought to you by Strong Catholic Families, Strong Catholic Youth, a national initiative presented in partnership by these organizations, working together to help parents bring home the faith. For more information, visit us at www.strongcatholicfamilies.org. I think that did a really great job of kind of summing up uh, these past couple of hours. So. Um, 
it, it, you know, here are some questions. Who is your faith role model and why? Who taught you how to pray? Why do you go to mass? Um, what difference your faith, your family has? So um, I, I want to open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions or comments to type those in there. I also just want to say that uh, you'll be getting a survey um, probably tomorrow. Um, for all those who have watched the webinar or are partaking in it now, um, that it's going to if it's going to ask you a lot of questions. One of if the option of a webinar is appealing, then please note that. Um, if there are other topics on family life that you would like to learn about, please tell us that. You know, technology, um, praying with scripture, how to deal with aging family members, um, how to have a conversation with your teenager. I mean, just anything like that, you know, let us know that. So we, we as a church know how to best serve you and help you grow in holiness with your family. There are also other resources on your handouts. Um, there's a couple of, there's a list of some prayers for the family. Um, but also anything that, any questions that you might have or thing, resources that you would like to see us develop, please include that in that questionnaire there. Um, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to, uh, to, to participate in the webinar. Um, and I would like to close with, with a prayer. Um, oh, here's a little summary of kind of what we talked about, but uh, I'm going to move on because we're almost out of time. Um, this is a closing prayer. So I will read it. And then after each, each uh, petition, if you could uh, respond to Lord, hear our prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ the Lord, word co-eternal with the Father, lived among us and chose to be part of a family and to enrich it with his blessings. Let us humbly ask for God's favor and protection on our families. Through your own obedience to Mary and Joseph, you consecrated family life. Make our families holy by your presence. We pray to you, Lord. Your heart was set on the concerns of your father. Make every home a place where he is worshipped with reverence. We pray to you, O Lord. You made your own family the model of prayer, of love, and obedience to your father's will. By your grace, make our families holy and rich with your gifts. We pray to you, O Lord. You love those who were close to you and they returned your love. Bind all families together, the bonds of peace and the, of love for each other. We pray to you, O Lord. At Cana in Galilee, when a new family was beginning, you gladdened it with your first miracle, changing water into wine. Alleviate the sorrows and worries of our families and change them into joy. We pray to you, O Lord. And let us pray the one prayer that, it, that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. We bless your name, O Lord, for sending your own incarnate son to become part of a family so that as he experienced its, its life, he would experience its worries and its joys. We ask you, Lord, to protect and watch over our families so that in the strength of your grace, its members may enjoy prosperity, possess the priceless gift of your peace, and as, as the church alive in the home, bear witness in this world to your glory. We ask this in the names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for uh, being present with us tonight. I'm going to see what these chats are. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to, ha to share. So uh, the key thing with this is also just, um, uh, you know, invite other families to watch it. You know, uh, gather some families together and maybe watch, watch them together and talk about how can, can your parish or how can this group kind of create their own group. Um, uh, uh, Roxanne and Matthew are, are kind of our DOS and coordinators for the domestic church group. So if that is something that you're interested in, if you will contact me, I will uh, send you to Matthew and Roxanne um, and get you in touch with them as they would be happy to share their story. So again, thank you all and um, God bless and may you have a peaceful night and a restful sleep. Good night. <laughs>